goodness gracious, I'm sort of sad to see us leave um, this series, uh, Wake Up, in the book of Daniel and Revelation. But I know I say this, but I really am. I'm so excited where we're headed next. I, you know, I literally, I can't wait for the Christmas series, Close Encounters. We're going to wrap up this, this year of space or whatever we did, which I didn't see that coming. I had no idea. It just sort of did that. Um, I am really excited about the last message of the year and the first message of the new year. Um, it's about climbing mountains. So go to REI, go, where, go to Academy Sports, buy some mountain climbing gear, whatever you got to do. Because here's the four words I keep hearing for next year. Hope, victory, yeah. expectation, and celebration. That's all I keep hearing for next year. And, and so I'm watching this already form um, in the new sermon series that, that's coming. So I am so excited. I'm so ready. Um, I have most of them already written. I know I joke about that, but I, Lily, we could stay here all afternoon and work through those sermons. But no, not really, because I want, I want you to come back each Sunday and just watch God build it and develop it. Well, here we are, the last sermon um, in the series, and it's entitled, Put on Your Shoes. Have you ever been traveling with your kiddos and they take everything off, right? Maybe everything, but you know what I mean. Like they get settled in. And after you go through that crucible of hearing, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? They kind of get used to settling into the vehicle. And about the time you arrive, you're like, put your shoes on. We're here, right? And that's the message. So here's where we've arrived. Uh, we started out on a great adventure of Daniel chapter 1. And the, the book of Daniel started out in the third year, right? So it already started out with this ominous date set of where the children of Israel are. And now it ends with literally put on your shoes, get back to work. There is hope. There is faith. What do you do in your journey with Christ when it, it seems to start out one way and you thought it was going to go the other? You know, I see it often in church when people get on fire for Christ or, or they're newly saved or they're, they're new believers. There's this immediate excitement and then begins the process of growing in Christ and there's almost this train wreck. They're like, I didn't expect that turn, right? Here was Daniel expecting, reading Jeremiah, expecting the captivity to end only quickly to learn in his own captivity that God had sanctioned so many more years, years that he would not see the end of it. And yet he kept questioning, Lord, when, Lord, how, Lord, why? But yet he was always faithful no matter the answer, no matter where he was. You and I are Daniels. We are sort of captive in this world right now, waiting for the return of our Christ, where you and I can inherit all that we know, that we pray, that we dream, that we long, that we hope for in Christ, but knowing that while our feet are on this earth, there's gonna be absolute moments of captivity where we're seeking understanding, where we're forced to our knees in prayer, and we're like, God, would you just get us to that point? Well, this is why this message is so important. What do you do when you find yourself living in captivity but longing for the return of Christ? Well, you put on your shoes and you get back to work. You know what I've discovered? And maybe go home and watch this. Those without Christ fear the uncertainty of how the world's going to end. Have you never noticed that? Like in all the movies that we produce, right? And in, in, in all of the shows and in the, in the little lines that we drop in all of our entertainment. Because those without Christ don't really have the story that you and I have. So therefore, they wake up with literal sort of headline hysteria, they wonder, what is this world coming to? How am I going to survive? What will be the end of this? What will happen when, when my life dies? And whether they believe in reincarnation or whether they believe in soul sleep or they just think as soon as I take my last breath and that's it and life is over, yet still they have this uncertainty, which uncertainty always breeds some level of insecurity and fear. And yet Christians know how the story ends, and so you and I should be living in that certainty, which gives you and I hope, which gives us victory, which gives us expectation, which allows us to celebrate every day that you and I are walking with Christ. So guess what? You might feel like you're in captivity, but put on those shoes. You and I don't fear the end of the world. We may be questioning, is it now? Are we really close? Are we the last generation? Is this it? 
All those questions may be running through your mind, but you and I don't live with that uncertainty. We know how it's going to end. Now watch this. We've worked our way through the book of Daniel. We now come to the end of Daniel. But you have to see this twist. If you don't see this, you'll miss it. And it's so brilliantly written by the power of the Holy Spirit. The first part of Daniel 12, the first part of Daniel 12, tells us about the prophecies of the end, which much of what we spent time talking about, right? But the second part of chapter 12 tells us the end of the prophecies. Now, that's significant to note. So we spend the majority of our time, especially here in in the first part of Daniel 12, but through this whole series, we've spent the majority of our time talking about the prophecies of the end. What can we expect? What has God shared with us? What do we know? What do we not know? What do we do with what we know? What do we do with what we don't know? We spent most of our time looking at that. But as we end this book, it actually, the Bible tells us there is an end to the prophecies well, what do we do next, right? So here's what we've learned. Here's the prophecies of the end time, really a quick glance at what we've walked through and and watch how far we've journeyed. In these prophecies of the end times, in the first part of Daniel 12, we see a number of things. We see a world ruler. This is what we know, the Antichrist. Whether he's on the scene now, we don't know, but he is, will be on the scene right, right before the, sometime around before the rapture happens because as soon as the church is raptured out, he sort of begins to take prominence politically. But here's what we know in the end times. There's a world ruler. There's a world religion, a one world faith. And we know it's not a religion toward God. We know that it's a religion worshiping uh, the dragon, the beast. There's a world war. We know that Armageddon. There's the tribulation. But we also see that God's people are delivered at the end of the tribulation. So those saints who accepted Christ after the rapture, during, we call them the tribulation saints, during the tribulation, they as well will receive this resurrection, uh, this joining of Christ. We know there's a resurrection and there's as well judgment, but there is the reward of the righteous. Here is what we know about the prophecies of the end time. So with that, join me, if you will, in Daniel chapter 12. And let's begin in in verse um, 5. Jump down to verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and a half time. There it is, a three and a half year period broken up, right? And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things will be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Of course he didn't, right? You're gonna see that in just a moment. Then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel. For the words are shut up and sealed until the end, until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But those who are wise, here it is, shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Watch, watch, watch. Blessed. Blessed is he who waits. And arrives at the 1,335 days. Now, there's a lot of theological conjecture here on why there's an added 45 days. Maybe it's for the resetting up of the temple. We're going to get into some of that in just a moment. But blessed is the man who waits for those days. Do you see that? Verse 13. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Oh my goodness, how do we even begin to explain this? Well, let's, let's try. So here's what we know about, about Daniel. We understand more about this than Daniel did. Is that not a phenomenal fact? Of all the things that we looked at and all of Daniel's wisdom and all that he understood and all that he was given. Now stop for just a moment. Imagine for just a moment you're Daniel. At the young age of 12 or 13 years of age, you're taken captive 
And for the rest of your life, you're going to be spending that in captivity under the rulership of the first time, the, one of the first Gentile leaders to be over the Jewish people. Think about, I mean, just how bad life has turned for Daniel and his friends and, and all the, the Hebrew children. But now you're spending 70 years in captivity. You don't know that, right? Think about that. You can't forecast that. But quickly into that, those 70 years of captivity, God begins to use you by allowing you to interpret dreams. And all through this, you become a man of prayer. You become a person of prayer. All through this, there's some of you, you understand there's a whole lot that you don't understand. Honestly, can you imagine being the one that God gave these prophecies to? Think about that. Now, to some extent, you can. Because there's a whole lot about life you understand right now. And there's a whole lot about life you don't understand right now. Why the times? Why the leadership? Why my health? Why the job? Why this relationship? Why is my marriage struggling? Why does life just seem to be on life support right now? There's a whole lot we don't understand. For many of us, you can't see further than the hand in front of your face, much less sort of plan for tomorrow, right? And you're like, Lord, I'm seeking understanding. But think about this. We understand more about this than Daniel did. Daniel did not have the writings of the book of Revelation like we do. He was missing sort of another companion piece that would explain a lot of what he saw. He didn't have the privilege of being there and hearing Jesus give the Olivet Discord, Matthew chapter 14, where he even further explained that. He didn't have the writings, the complete writings that you and I hold in our hand that that we call the Bible, where we get to read out of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. He was, we know, studying Jeremiah, but he, he didn't have the pleasure of understanding and watching God continue to move through the remaining Old Testament prophets. Imagine this. We know more about this than Daniel ever could. But we, like Daniel, listen, are still trusting in the same great I am. That's why we sang that song. We, like Daniel, are still in the same position. We need to be a people of prayer because we must be a people of understanding. And a person of understanding is a person of prayer. And Lord, you have called us into this church age, which is honestly one of the most phenomenal things you and I could ever be a part of. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 tells you and I that, that God chose the church to express the manifold wisdom of God. The Old Testament prophets didn't even see what you and I are a part of. The angels longed to look into. The reason why I'm on my tiptoes is because there's two different words of longing and looking into. Remember that? When we, looked, when we went through the book of 1 Peter, literally the angels are standing on their tiptoes to watch you and I experience the grace of God on a daily basis. The things that the prophets never saw and, and sought deeply to understand, the very thing that the angels longed to look into, and the last part of Ephesians 3 verse 10 says that the manifold wisdom of God by, used by the church is for the cosmic rulers and the world rulers. Literally, the church is the cosmic theater for the grace of God. Think about that for just a moment. Talk about ultra high def 4K. I mean, it blows your television away. In other words, the experience that the church is literally is for the entire world, the universes, to look at and wonder, and this is what you and I get to be a part of, experiencing the grace of God. So what does that mean to you and I? Well, we have the final words here given to Daniel. What do we do with this prophecy? Now that I know, okay, now that I got the timeline straight, that at some point, we don't know when, there's going to be a, a sound, and it's, then it's going to be the rapture, and the saints that are in, in Christ, that are dead in Christ, are going to rise, and those who are alive are going to be caught up with him in the air. And from there, the clock starts ticking, right? Seven years has been proclaimed. Israel's in time out. When the rapture happens, Israel's back in time, and God's going to deal with them. And it, that seven-year period is broken up into two and in, in, in half, three and a half, right? We know that. Like, great, Pastor Ron, that's awesome. Some of this makes a little more sense. Well, what do we do with this now? Well, we follow the same instructions that were given to Daniel. Number one, he tells them to protect the prophecy. Go back to Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Listen to what he tells him right here. He says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words... And seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, watch, and knowledge shall increase. Now, here's what's interesting. John, writing the book of Revelation, wasn't told to shut up his writings. As a matter of fact, he says, make them known. Publish them. It's so interesting to to watch the differences in the two. But Daniel was told to protect the prophecy. 
Now, we know why. Because Jesus still had to come. There had to be things like his birth, um, his in entry into Jerusalem, his uh, denial, uh, his, his trial, his uh, crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, which ushered in the church age. So as Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit came down, and the Holy Spirit then instituted and helped start the, the church age that you and I know about, which is why you and I are now working to walk faithful in Christ, to be salt and light in this world, and to share with everybody who has an ear and a heart who Christ is, because at some moment, unannounced moment, at any moment, there's going to be a trumpet and you and I are going to be caught up and those that aren't in Christ are going to be left behind. So our goal is to not leave anybody behind. So you and I know that. So why? What does this mean to us? It literally means to protect the prophecy. These words, when the Bible tells us that, that men and women are going to, during the tribulation, are going to be seeking knowledge. Like something tragic, like the rapture is going to happen. The world, I mean, think about this for a moment. Think about those, those airplanes, right? And we've got pilots in here. Think about those, those airplanes that are piloted by Christian airplanes. They're going down. Think about the, the vehicles that are driven. Just think about all the Christians that are in the world right now. When we're gone, tragedy immediately starts. And automatically, the Bible tells us, knowledge will increase. Meaning, people are going to be seeking what's going on here. And it might just be that your next door neighbor, I don't know, could be left behind. And they might say, wait a minute. I remember them going to church. Is there something? And they're going to they're gonna rummage through your house. They're going to be wearing your clothes. But it doesn't matter to you. But anyway, right? And, and maybe, maybe when they come across that one jacket that they coveted, you've hit a Bible in it. I don't know. Kind of making fun of a very grim situation here. But the Bible tells us that knowledge will increase. And people are going to run around to and fro. They're going to be seeking and asking at that moment, they're absolutely going to know that economy failed them, politics failed them, science failed them, evolution failed them. Every theory they've ever placed their hope in absolutely failed them. They're going to be looking for hope. Protect the prophecy. How do you do that? Well, you begin to be the only church that some people may ever see. You begin to be the only word of God that some people may ever read. You hide the word of God in your heart. So in a situation, it literally comes out of your mouth. So just by divine providence, that person you were around at that last moment, they're left behind, they might just search the scriptures and it might just be yours. I go back often and a number of Bibles I use for studying and, and one of them was a Bible that was purchased for me by my family when I was called into ministry and my mom started out with it and, and somewhat my dad, but mostly my mom and she journaled like all of the very first four or five years of the sermons and I go back through and I'm still studying that because it's an excellent study Bible the Believer Study Bible by W.A. Crystal, and I was reading through that, and I, and I see in there notes that she made, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I preached that. That's a really good point, and, but I look, I look back at her notes, and even just those short little six, seven words around those scriptures help me understand the scriptures. Do you have a Bible that is marked in your house so when people are left behind, they can go to the survival kit for the tribulation period and go, now this makes sense. Think about that. You won't be here if you're a follower in Christ, but the Bible that you set aside just might be here, and that Bible may just bring somebody to Christ. Think about that for just a moment. I know it's really hard for the mind to compute that and think that, but literally make some notes in your Bible. Literally sort of set aside a, an end times kit, right? I mean, I know some people in here are preppers. I mean, you've got beans for days, right? Uh, I mean, you, you, you're ready. I get it. I, I think I've got a one-week supply of kidney beans. I don't, well, whatever. But, I mean, think about this for just a moment. Do you have a Bible supply? Do you have a ration of guidance left behind so when those that are seeking knowledge, our world is going to be an absolute pandemonium, and people are going to be seeking answers. What does this mean? What is happening right now? How do we navigate this? Who even knows what's happening right now? They're not going to have Christian commentators and Christian radio and Z88.3 left behind to tell them. They're not. They're going to have what you and I leave behind that speak testimony of the one Christ we followed. Protect the prophecy. How? You need to memorize scripture, of course, now. You need to hide the word of God in your heart because you never know in what situation you may be called upon to speak truth. And you never know those ears that are around you may be listening and you, just, you, just, you and I just never know. You and I just never know who might be around us. Do you have the word of God in your heart? 
Do you know it well enough when tragedy strikes in, in somebody's heart and life that, you be, that you're able to speak that word of God and truth in your life? Listen, the one thing that's going to be sought after, the word of God, is the one thing you and I carry around in multiple versions. And it's going to be the one thing that is needed. And the 144,000 Jewish evangelists are going to be going around sharing the word of God. Wouldn't that be cool if they actually picked up your Bible and used it to preach to a crowd of lost people? Think about that for just a moment. What are these final words? Number one, protect the prophecy. Number two, and here it is. What, what do we do at the end of this sermon series, Pastor Ron? Well, you proceed with your life. You see, Daniel, I mean, I would have been so overwhelmed by what was just given to me. And he was as well. The Bible, remember, go back to Daniel chapter eight. He, he literally tells us that he was sick in bed for days. Remember that? Because the, the interpretations overwhelmed him so much but then eventually it says, but I went about the king's business. This is what you and I do. So here's the thing that prophecy seeking can do for Christians. One, it can cause you and I to, to live in doom and gloom. It can also cause you and I to look for the devil behind every door and blame the devil for everything, right? When sometimes it's maybe our own decisions. The other thing it can cause us to do is it can cause you and I to continue to seek more information, but do nothing with it. What do I do with this information? What do I do when I'm living in a world of captivity? You see, Daniel's life is our life as a follower of Christ. Until we are where we're supposed to be. Heaven is our home, right? Earth is a desert drear. Heaven is my home. Heaven is my fatherland. Heaven is my home. You and I aren't meant to make a life and a living here. This is not where we're eternally going to dwell. Remember, we are, we are sometimes so earthly minded, we're of no heavenly good. Well, we need to be reminded that earth is just a dress rehearsal for where we're he headed. So what does this mean, proceed with your life? Here's the real way you and I respond to prophecy. We continue to be people of prayer. We continue to be people of the word. We go out and live the life that God has called us to live. Everybody in here who names themselves as a follower of Christ, every one of us have the same job description, to go and tell, to go and share. To go and tell and to go and share. Go, go back to Daniel chapter 12 and jump down to verse nine. We were at verse four, jump down to verse nine. He said, go your way, Daniel. There it is. For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Go your way. What does that mean? Do the will of God for your life. That's literally what that means. Do the will of God for your life. Go your way and live that out. Now, here's a really cool note. Here's a really cool note. And it rings so true to me, maybe more so, is Daniel was in his 80s. Like late 80s when this was given, anywhere from 84 to 87 years of age. Now, hang on. I know a lot of our senior adults, and not just here, but others, are like, I'm just going to time for me to retire and give it to the younger crowd. Well, have you read the book of Titus? The book of Titus says for the older women, and, and as well, it's inferred the older men to pass on your faith. Senior adults should be a walking library of experiences with God. When's the last time somebody checked out a book of your experience, of your life, and you let them read it, if you know what I mean? You should be a walking library. You, you know my prayer for Waterstone is, Lord, let me be in my late 80s and right and this slobbering and just kind of fall down, hopefully not in front of everybody, but whatever, right? And just let me die. You have called me to preach, and I want to die preaching. Not right now, not right now. I didn't mean that. Like, I have to be specific, Right? But my prayer is, Lord, I'm serious, Lord, let me retire. Let me die. I don't, there's no, pastors don't retire. Change that word. I don't do that. It's my, I live my call until I get my last breath, right? Lord, Lord, let me finish my days. I get this. In a few weeks, we're going to look at the life of Caleb. Caleb was 40 years old when God promised him a certain land. And now he says these 45 years later, he's 85 when he tells God, I feel just as young now as I did when I was 40 years old. But yeah. <laughs> Somebody felt that. That's awesome. Oh my gosh, that was great. I love that, right? But that's, proceed with your life. No matter what's taking place in your life, your life is never wasted. Turn your life around right now and give it to God, no matter what your age is, no matter what you've been through. That's a, to me, that's a really cool note. Daniel, go your way. He must have been like 87 and said, well, God, I can't get there. I'm really slow. He didn't. He continued to serve until his last day. Well, how do we do this? What are these final words? How do we proceed? Can I rattle these off? Number one, establish Christ in your hearts. We go back to Daniel chapter one. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, 
But in Daniel chapter one, what, what do you and I need to do every day? Number one, you have to establish Christ in your hearts. Have you not lived long enough to know that it doesn't take long to get up in the morning to get down in the morning? I mean, as soon as you get up, it's bad news America, right? And bad news world. Somebody was shot. Something's on fire. There's another war. Something else has happened. The Dow received its lowest day in year. Have you not learned that this is life? But one thing you and I know that the moment we establish Christ in our hearts, our world is going to do this. But as long as we establish our life in Christ, I'm able to do this through all of this. If you get up in the morning and seek anything other than Christ, your life is going to go up and down. Your emotions, your relationships, your expectations, your hope, your excitement, your faithfulness. You're going to live just like the rest of the world lives, up and down. The Bible says a, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Like, like you're on the waves, tossed to and fro. Stop riding those waves. Literally, wake up and establish Christ in your hearts. Simply, how do you do that? I'm going to tell you, simply how you do it. You just say, God, today I give you this day. That's all you do. You literally just say, God, I give you this day. Every Monday, probably maybe tonight, but Monday morning, I'll wake up and find out what my schedule is. And you've heard me say that before. I'm like, okay, God, here's the schedule, but I need you to intervene and ordain. If this is something that's been placed on the calendar that is, that is not in your will or it's in your way, then Lord, I'm going to follow you. I want to be able to adjust my schedule to you. And anybody that knows me knows that I'm a guy that when we say we're going from here to there, I'm like, well, why are we not there? Like, why are we going? Why are we taking this route? Why are we taking this route? So every day for me to get up and say, God, this is your day. I, I give this day. Surrender your day to Christ. Here's number two. Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. We learned this from Daniel. The guy who was told, hey, eat this diet. The guy who was told, bow down to the statue. The guy that was told, don't pray anymore. Thrown into the lion's den. This is who we learn from. We can stand firm in our faith because our God is always faithful to us. If there's one thing we've learned, our God doesn't just notice the big things. He's in all the little details. We learn that overwhelmingly from Daniel. Prepare for the future. This is what you do, number three. Prepare for the future. How do you prepare for the future? You literally just say, Lord, I'm trusting in your faithfulness. I don't have all the understanding, but I know you do, so I'm trusting you. Be a person of prayer. Oh, how have we learned that? How have we learned it? I don't know what happened last Sunday, and I love, I love it about that, that there, the, these things happen on Sundays that I, I would never expect. Normally, after a Sunday message, I receive anywhere from, I don't know, 15 to 20 texts. Another, the next two or three days, I'll receive a good 15, 20 emails along that line. I'll even receive a few cards. Just, in other words, a lot, of, a lot of notes that say, man, this was the message. This is what this did. This is going to that. I received almost triple the amount from last Sunday's sermon. I have no idea what happened. All I know is as soon as I walked down the lobby, somebody said, Pastor Ron, ha the, the entire bathroom's full of people crying. I'm like, oh no, like what happened? Like what do we, she's like, no, God just was doing something. I love that about Sunday morning. I, I don't know what God did in, in last Sunday's message, but here's what I know. You prepare for your future by getting into the word of God and saying, okay, God, I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but I know you're already there. So, Lord, I'm going to trust you as I walk. I am a person of prayer. I'm preparing for the future. I'm standing firm. I'm establishing Christ. Here's the next one. Hide God's word in your heart. You have got to hide the word of God in your heart. I'm just telling you right now, the thing that you and I just carry around all day long, the thing that you and I have sitting on multiple shelves and bookshelves and multiple different versions and different types of bindings and book covers, the thing that you and I have right now is the one thing people are going to be searching when you and I are out of here. They're going to say, help me make sense of this. Keep your eyes on the king. That's the next one. Keep your eyes on the king. Is it not so easy to keep your eyes on politics and finances and events and struggles? This past week was honestly one of the heaviest that's been in a long time in terms of like holiday weekends. The things that, that we as a church sort of had to work through and walk people through in life moments that happen. And when those life moments happen, sometimes it's hard to keep your eyes on the king. You want to look at that thing and say, God, why? 
Like I confessed last week, there was a time when I just said, Lord, uh, I don't get that. But no matter what's happening around you and I, what we've learned from Daniel is keep your eyes on the king. Ask for wisdom. You have to continually ask for wisdom. Not always understanding, but wisdom. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Knowledge is getting the facts. Wisdom is knowing what to do with the facts. You, the device you have in your hand is full of facts, but it takes wisdom to know what to do with the facts you've discovered from your relationship with Christ. Ask, beg, pray for wisdom. Live for another kingdom. Oh my goodness. You and I have got to learn to live for another kingdom. This kingdom of the world is fading away. Have you not noticed this one thing about time? Time forgets all of us. Nature moves on after you and I die. You and I need to learn to live that this kingdom is eroding. This kingdom's failing. This kingdom's fading. Don't plant roots in this kingdom. Plant your eyes on that other kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. And remember this, the best is yet to come. He gives us that here in just a moment. In Daniel chapter 12, the best is yet to come. Why? Why do we say that? Because here's what I love about Daniel 12. The end of times is literally just the beginning of the walk. That's what, literally what he tells them. The end of times is literally the, the beginning of the walk. So here's the deal. When you're traveling with your children and you're like, put on your shoes. When they put on their shoes, it's not that the trip is over. You're just now telling them it's about to begin. Daniel was seeking understanding. What does this mean? So those 70 years of captivity for him, that wasn't the journey. The journey was about to begin. And I love that. I love that. We understand this in Romans chapter 13. It's our banner verse for this entire series. Verse 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. Amen to that, right? In other words, light has come. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Hey, folks, start living your life like it's constantly exposed. Walk as if it's in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and sensuality. Not in quarreling or jealousy. Isn't it amazing that, that, that God put jealousy in there with orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality? Seriously, think about that for just a moment. Get that out of your system if it's there. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That's how you live. That's how you live. What else do we do? We shine our light. We literally shine our light. Go back to Daniel 12, verse 3. I love, 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 love this verse. Especially this time of year, because I think in preaching it, I think you can get it. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Shine. This is your time to shine. Now, here's something cool, and I think it's cool. I didn't really plan it this way. But tonight begins the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah, if, let me just give you a brief explanation of Hanukkah. One of the guys we studied in the book of Daniel, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was sort of an epitome of what the Antichrist would be, but of course the Antichrist, much worse, horribly mistreated the Jews. Remember, he's the guy that literally would cut open the bellies of pregnant women and hang their babies around their neck and make them walk around town with their dead babies around their neck as a way of punishment for saying, you worship that God when you don't worship me. This is how bad this guy was. Well, a group of Jews, the Maccabeans, were so frustrated, overwhelmed at this, especially when it came to the, the desecration of the temple, because he set up his own worship and his own idols in their temple, that the, the Maccabeans put a revolt, and they were, they were small in number to the Syrian army, but actually their warfare is still studied to this day of how they did this. This small army came in and took over and took back the temple. Now, when they got there, they wanted to celebrate by lighting the candles that was extinguished in the temple. There was only enough oil to maybe light the candles for a day. Miraculously, that candle stayed lit for eight days. 
the reason why there's eight candles on the menorah with a helper candle. So what is Hanukkah? Hanukkah is the festival of lights. This weekend, we're going to celebrate, light up the holidays. Every, everywhere, light up UCF, light up Sanford, right? Light up, light up everywhere, light up my house, right? It's, it's light up everywhere. I mean, because it's the season. And, and, and it's, we, you and I will travel to neighborhoods to look at the lights. We'll go to places to see the, the lighting of the tree. And, and by the way, um, light up the holidays for us is huge. And the city has asked us to help, help in our booth help facilitate over 3,000 kids coming through. That's potentially six to 8,000 parents that we get to touch. And I'm just telling you right now, we still need about 20, 20 people for that seven to nine shift. Folks, we gotta sign up for that. When the city calls the church and says, help us reach over 3,000 kids coming through your booth, we're gonna say yes. We're gonna say yes to reach families. So if you have the ability to help us, it's this coming weekend. You gotta well, light, up, light up the holidays. That's what it's all about. But here's what's so cool about this. When the Bible tells you and I to shine our light, it's just like when you put those lights on in your house and everybody gets to drive by it and how you and I are just love driving by the lights. The world is dark around you. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Culture is sick of itself. That's why it's always fighting. That's why it's always rioting. That's why there's so much anger in the news and on social media. It's sick of itself. And there's no light on social media. There's no light in our world like the light of Christ. And you have been given that light. If you are a follower of Christ, shine your light. Now is the season to do this. Again, this is not the end of the journey. When you ask your kids to put on their shoes, it's just the beginning. We're just beginning. What do we learn from Daniel? Daniel reveals the possibility of godless godliness in an ungodly world. Right now you're thinking, Pastor Ron, you don't know my work. The ethics there are horrible. My, co my co-workers, my bosses, the, the environment that I in, it's ungodly. You're a Daniel. You're thinking in my neighborhood, it's Pastor Ron, this and that, the language, you're a Daniel. You're thinking maybe even, even, there's some struggles even in my own family, my extended family or family in other states. They don't know Christ. You're a Daniel. Every one of us are put in this world to be Daniels. And you and I can model our life after him. Listen to me. The end is the beginning. Did you hear that? Go back and let me finish with one of the most amazing verses. It's the last verse. The most amazing verse out of the entire book of Daniel to me. Out of all the prophecies, out of all that we've read, verse 13. But go your way till the end. Now watch. And you shall rest. Stop. Daniel had not had rest in over 70 years. Are you tired of this world? I mean, be honest. Are, are, are you just tired of pursuing the next paycheck, pursuing the next device, pursuing the next relationship, pursuing the next thing that this world can offer? Are, 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 you, are you even weary, to be honest, would you be honest and say, I'm weary of praying? I just don't see the answer. Lord, and every day I wake up, this world gets further and further away from you and darker and darker and darker. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Are you tired of this world? Are you weary? It's because you and I were never meant to find rest in this world. Those words to Daniel, when he says, Daniel, go your way, you'll find rest. To a man that had been held in captivity for 70 years, those words sounded like airplane engine noise to a person on a deserted island. There's hope. There's victory. There's celebration. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you're carrying this morning. I don't know how weighted down you are. In the past week, the number of attempted suicides, the number of deaths, the number of difficulties just in the, in the past few weeks that I've heard of people going through, there are so many people that are overwhelmed by darkness, discouragement, and depression. It's enveloping them, and it's overwhelming them. Listen to me. In Christ, there is light. In Christ, there is life. In Christ, there is hope. Whatever you're carrying this morning, you don't have to carry it. You don't have to carry it. There is hope in Christ. There is life in Christ. There is light in Christ. When you come to Christ, he literally says, walk your way and you'll find rest. 
Every one of us here today needs rest. Daniel, 70 years of captivity, and God promises him rest. But he also promises that he'll receive his inheritance. I can't wait to speak on that in February. I can't wait to show you what that means to to get that inheritance that God has given us. He gives him rest. He says, you're going to receive your inheritance, and you're going to be resurrected one day. In other words, this world is not yours, so quit seeking understanding here. One day, you're going to receive your allotment in heaven. Amen. Aren't you glad this world is not our home? What a horrible place to settle down. Amen. But thank God he has called us to minister in this world, to be a light in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of unfaithfulness, in the midst of ungodliness. What do I do? What do I do? I wish I'd have done this last week. Mr. P, last week, everybody called me Mr. Rogers because I wore a cardigan, right? And, and I thought, well, you know what? That's actually kind of cool, because, but I should have done it this Sunday. I should have come in like Mr. Rogers and sat down and changed shoes, right? Because that's the message I should have changed shoes because literally, put on your shoes. The world is waiting out there to see people who live in hope, who live in victory, who live in expectation, who live in light, who have life, who have purpose, who have hope. The world is waiting to see people of hope. The world is waiting to see people that don't belong to this world, who are living for another world, and that's you. That is you. What do I do with this prophecy? Put on your shoes. Put on your shoes. We're almost there. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. We're almost there. Put on your shoes. Amen. Amen. 